When your mother was your age, she found a paper on Plato's cave allegory in my study. She was clearly too young to understand the abstract concept Plato was suggesting. Nevertheless, she read it over and over. It was this one thought that turned her world upside down. The idea that our knowledge has limits and that we can never know if things truly are how they appear. We are in a slumber, unaware of the true nature of things. One evening she came to me and said, if it's true what Plato argues, then how do we know if anything is real? How do we know that the actual reality isn't outside the life we're living? It was a mighty big thought for a girl her age. I looked at her and asked her, isn't that what God is? The creator of our reality? She thought about it for a moment, and then she answered, but then it's the world God is living in that's real. And we are just his doll's house. And then again, who created God? Doesn't it go on endlessly? In a way, this here is a doll's house. And it was built for you. We continue parting like it's 1899. The show, that is, which is where the clip is from. All of what you heard is what the Gnostics speculated on. As Stephen Davis explained in my book, Voices of Gnosticism, the story of Gnosticism is basically how God went crazy and became us, and finding the means to reverse the process. How do you do that, though? Easy but hard. Our awakening is our recovery of God's sanity. Our leaving Plato's cave is simply accessing our complete psyche by looking inward and releasing our destined potential. As Buddhist scholar and former monk Kori Muscara said, Finding your true self is an act of love. Expressing it is an act of rebellion. A sign of growth is having more tolerance for discomfort, but it's also having less tolerance for bullshit. Who you are is not your fault, but it is your responsibility. Randall, there's an old Zen koan. It goes like this. Everyone has two lives, and the second life begins the moment you realize that all along, you only had one. Very Gnostic indeed. And as William Blake wrote, no one ever discovered the unknown by traveling through the known. Acquired knowledge has its limits. Whoa. Know the unknown to find the reality behind reality. Go within to find your true self. The awakening of any individual is a cosmic rebellion. Become sane to restore the divine because it is your responsibility as a son or daughter of Hermes, the god of thieves, and Sophia, the goddess of smugglers. No matter what anybody tells you, words and ideas can change the world. All of this is the Gnostic path. You can include the wise words of the Cheshire Cat. Imagination is the only weapon in the war against reality. Whoa. With all of this spiritual tech, we got the Archons and their Karens and Katamites in the establishment on their Balenciaga heels and close to falling off the woke cliff. As James True said, this is the best apocalypse ever, especially for us from the broken places. We're running with those searching for the truth and avoiding those who have found it. We're writing our own gospel and living our own myth. And I think he made us forget why we're here. Our world has rules and they can't be bent. But nothing in this world follows any rules of logic. This here, it isn't real. It's an illusion, a magic trick. 
And where have you arrived? This is blasphemy! This is madness! Yes, yes. Aeon Bytnostic Radio, an initiation by conversation into the dark corners of myth, magic, and meaning. A crash course in cult culture and conspiracy. A virtuous virus invoking and informing history, holiness, and heresy. Each week, I, your host, Miguel Connor, commandeers your connection to bring you the most accepted and rejected scholars and provocateurs to your attention. Fun, compelling, and deeply weird, this is the blow-your-mind cocktail party conversation you always wanted to listen in on. And party like it's 1899. In the end, the universe tends to unfold as it should. Plus, I have a really large penis. That keeps me happy. And yes, the Netflix show 1899 is some of the best Gnostic fare this year, along with Everything Everywhere at Once and Severance. And Aeon Bite continues to be the best source for Gnosticism and the general freedom of humanity psyche this year and the coming 2023 especially now that I have opened the Virtual Alexandria Academy. And check it out on the show notes. I gotta have more cowbell! In this eternal now, we'll be discussing that connection between UFOs and spirituality, which, as Chris Knoll said, is also an element of Gnosticism. As Eric Davis wrote, the Gnostics were the first spiritual off-worlders, and their texts crackle with a sci-fi sensibility. As we've demonstrated, movements like Heaven's Gate, Scientology, and the Church of the Subgenius, and really any impactful UFO cult, are just modern-day Gnostic cultism. Mulder, the truth is out there, but so are lies. As April DeConnick wrote in the Gnostic New Age, Gnostics decided that the time had come to get some answers. Like Truman in The Truman Show, the answers they sought could not be found within the chaos of their world. A universe that seemed constructed to deceive them at every turn. What they sought was reality beyond the door in the sky, at the top of the celestial dome, beyond whatever cunning simulation this world might be. The quest for reality is the central feature of Gnostic spirituality. The Gnostics understand this quest to culminate in the direct knowledge of a supreme god who dwells outside the known universe. Valentinus believed the world we live in was created by a cruel god, and slightly stupid. A god that will send you plagues, or requires sacrifices, or destroys Babylon. He wasn't wrong about that. The bastard had a mean temper. Humans can escape this world and return to the real one, the kingdom. And for that, you needed to achieve the Gnosis. To further drive this point and drive some incredible new insights into your becoming awake and making God sane, we have the honor of being joined at the Virtual Alexandria by Wallace Wagner. He will be discussing his book, Within Grasp an excellent work on the metaphysics and the metaphysical promises of extraterrestrial experiences in ancient and modern times. From the Book of Enoch to today's abductions, Wallace takes us on a probing, pardon the pun, odyssey of the religiosity of UFOs. You know, stones from the sky, they're once considered God sent. Origins of creation itself. Oh, yeah, you're talking about the panspermia theory. The idea that meteoric debris seeded our planet with the building blocks of life. I'm talking reality, brother. Meteorites are the bedrock of all religions. You know the statue of the goddess that's worshipped by the Romans at the Vatican? That statue was carved from the same black arrow as the Kaaba Muslims face when they kneel in prayer. It was David Pierce who said, The simulation argument is perhaps the first interesting argument for the existence of a creator in 2,000 years. And as both Rizverk and Rodney Asher said on Aeon Byte, 
the simulation theory might finally be a religion that both theism and atheism can unite around. Whoa. What about ufology? Is it a religion? Does it contain theological aspects? Certainly, and it's already happening, as Diana Pasulka explained on this show and her book, American Cosmic. The same argument is made in the book Supernatural by Jeff Kripal and Whitley Strieber. And Jeff was on the show to explain it. Whoa. Sir, this is a Wendy's. The toothpaste is out of the tube, as they say. So we gotta deal with it. In this age of Hermes, UFOs are part of the news cycle, social media feeds, and mainstream banter. Gnosis seeks the metaphysics of the extraterrestrial, as it does with runaway technology. Gnosis makes conspiracy theory an avenue to the archetypal forces that help us make God sane. God isn't interested in technology. He knows nothing of the potential of the microchip or the silicon revolution. Look how he spends his time. 43 species of parrots. Nipples for men. Jung wrote in his book about flying saucers that UFOs and extraterrestrials are not just a rumor or a myth, but a living myth. The topic is also a reversal of our enlightened rational age. In other words, this phenomenon is from dream time, for it lifts the archonic veil and strikes Saturn's grip. Jung said, too, that the proper study of the UFO was in the human psyche. Is this all real? Or is it just happening inside my head? Of course it's happening inside your head, Harry. Why should that mean that it's not real? What else is new in the Gnostic worldview? We party like it's 1899 because we know that our minds hold all the keys as we ultimately have the mind of God. As above, so below. Plus, we love our authentic selves, as Muscara said, and love, as I've said before, is merely the destruction of time. Without time, everything happens everywhere at once, and we see reality behind reality. Right, Michelle Yeoh? My silly husband is probably making things worse. We perceive dream time and the call of Tiamat. Like the Gnostics and Hermeticists, we tap into the soul of ancient Egypt and its focus on eternity and the timeless dream of Atum. Is this what you do with eternity? Now you know. Hope I'm not getting too woo-woo, but to break through, our awareness must shift once and for all. As the saying goes, we cannot solve problems with the same thinking that got us into those problems. And reality is a problem these days. Always has been. Led us to our interview with Wallace Wagner. Trapped in here, you are. Trapped in what? You said it yourself. We will never know whether the stimuli in our brains are caused by reality or just by the construct of one. Construct of one? This isn't real. This is a simulation. Plato's cave allegory. You're watching shadows on the wall. And you think that they're the reality? If you don't look over your shoulder, you would see what's causing those shadows. It's actually real. You forgot. You forgot what's real. But you have to remember. You have to wake up. Or there will be nothing left to wake up for. And your consciousness will be trapped in here forever. This is the Aeon Byte interview. And with us, we have the pleasure of being joined by Wallace Wagner, 
to discuss his book Within Grasp and other incredibly interesting sundries. Wallace, thank you very much for coming on the show. My goal and Vance, thank you very much for having me. Pleasure is all ours. And yes, with us too, we've got the Moondog Van Saatchi. Vance, how are you doing? I'm fine this wonderful afternoon and are ready to go with the UFO. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. Here we are, such an important topic. So, but uh, Wallace, why don't we start with you and uh, your life? Uh, it's like, as we were talking before, and as your book details, you've had a very interesting life uh, in the last, what, six years, and it started with an encounter. Maybe share with the audience about how things just changed in your life. Well, I did have an encounter in 2016. At the time, I was a mailman, actually, one of many jobs I've had. Um, I had just made a delivery here in this county. I'm in Bedford County, Virginia, in between Roanoke and Lynchburg. And um, I was walking back to my Jeep, and something or somebody told me to stop and look up. And sure enough, that's exactly what I did standing out in, in the lady's front yard. And directly over my head was what we now call a white Tic Tac UFO or UAP. I'm guessing uh, originally I thought it was maybe 2,000 feet. Now I'm thinking it's closer to 1,500 feet. I've been back there several times. Um, it appeared as a solid, white, cylindrical, gleaming white object with no windows, no wings, no nacelles, nothing to cause it to be sitting stationary in the sky. So, of course, all the, all the thoughts through my brain was, is this a helium balloon or is this a, a Goodyear blimp? Right. <laughs> or is this maybe Google Earth taking pictures of me? <laughs> <laughs> uh, none of the above was was uh, applicable. I saw it for about three seconds, and then it literally disappeared. And, uh, of course, what went through my mind was, you know, what happened? Did I really see it? Did it want me to see it? Maybe it cloaked and it's still there watching me. Or maybe it, there was a malfunction. And I accidentally saw it, you know, for the three seconds. And then I decided, well, maybe it took off so fast I couldn't see it, or maybe it went into another dimension, or all this stuff was going through my brain. And I, I pretty much decided it's, it cloaked. And uh, it just allowed me to see it for three seconds. Maybe, maybe the inhabitants knew I was going to write a book which was not in my, you know, in my future at that time. But uh, henceforth, I've written two books uh, as a result of that. And uh, it's changed a lot of my realities. So that one encounter was just, it changed your reality forever. Like Paul well, seeing the light of Jesus, just that few seconds and that was enough. That was enough. I had, I had read uh, Von Daniken's Chariots of the Gods back in the 70s. In fact, that was the first book that I ever started that I could not finish. I mean, I just had to finish it. I could not put it down. And so that was in the back of my mind. But for the previous 25 years before 2016, you know, I, I was pretty much drinking the Kool-Aid of uh, the Earth 6,000 years old, uh, once saved, always saved, right. the UFOs are from the devil. You know, things of that nature, pretty much ultra conservative Christianity. And uh, seeing this craft certainly caused me to back up and re examine. And when I re examined and started studying other scriptures, uh, let's just say the blinders came off. And uh, thanks to Reverend Michael Carter, uh, he convinced me I was on this path, and he convinced me that the gates of Western Christianity do indeed have hinges, and I've gone outside the gate, 
and uh, I'm on this path now, and I'm, exp- you know, I've just received all kinds of new information and new realities, and it's completely changed my foundational beliefs. So there you have it in a nutshell. Yeah, and uh, we have had the honor of uh, hosting the Reverend Michael Carter twice on the show. Always love his information. He's and his the real ideas. deal. Mm-hmm. Yeah, great guy, and he's definitely, uh, I think uh, what I like about Michael, and maybe that's what you like, or one of the many reasons is that it doesn't have to be an either or right you don't have to throw out the baby with the bath water (laughs) you don't have to join heaven's gate or something and just discard your christian background you can work with both right i do work with both and i'm glad you mentioned the word christian i i am a disciple of jesus now and i focus on jesus a lot more than the old testament um I've pretty much done away with believing that the uh, God of the Old Testament is the father of Jesus. I mean, that's one of the places I've gone. So uh, I I just consider myself a disciple of Jesus now and pretty much a New Testament believer. That's great. Yeah. And that's, again, you don't have to throw out anything or replace it. These things can be uh, complementary. And they can uh, certainly just like like you, it just expands your oh, mind sure, into so sure. many possibilities and makes the universe a really a more wonderful place. Don't you agree? I totally agree, and, and I've really come to believe that the universe operates off of love. Love is the common thread through everything, and it, it's a love in such abundance we can't even absorb it or or our. our you know, understand it. It, it permeates everything. And, and it, going back through the Bible, you realize that these crafts have been with us since it was written. And then doing extracurricular activity, you realize they've been here all along. So I'm, I'm an ancient alien believer now, pretty much that uh, all these gods and all these different cultures and all these different times all came down from the sky and they just didn't free fall. They came in crafts and they retreated as gods. So that's pretty much my belief now. And Wallace, this is something I always, whenever we have the topic of the UFOs or whatever UAPs, whatever nonsense they want to call it today, obviously the government, uh, not just the American government, but other governments are more open about these objects and visitors. And it's no longer, as I, as I often mention, individuals like Vance, you and I are no longer like the cookie fellows you'd find at some uh, convention in Nevada or something like that. The French people, now it's mainstream, this topic, even though, uh, you know, UFO hunters and all that have just been following the data and the science for generations. But uh, we wonder when uh, is the government hiding something? What's going on in your book? You write, I used to think full blown disclosure was on the horizon, but now I'm not sure. So you think that the government is still hiding more than? Uh, oh, they- I know, I know they are. <laughs> I, I, you're talking to a fellow who believes in a secret government and a secret space force, and we've already been to the moon and to Mars and way out there. Um. I'm I'm 99.9% sure on on that. Um, Originally, I thought maybe we were going to have disclosure. And, you know, when the uh, tic-tac videos came out about a year and a half after I saw my tic-tac, I was vindicated. But now recently, of course, the Navy uh, decided that uh, we're not going to get any more videos like what we've already gotten. The faucet has been turned off. Yeah, you know, they also, uh, I just saw an article where they're starting to walk back the Tic Tacs uh, and videos and so forth. Uh, They're starting to back off as well. It's just that we don't have enough instrumentation to determine what they are and blah, 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 blah. The usual, you know, they they came out so far and then now they're pulling back. (laughs) Exactly. Exactly. So being that I've 
I, I'm sure we have a secret government and a secret space force. I'm a firm believer in Ben Rich, uh, the former Lockheed Skunk Works uh, head, who in the early 90s said we've already been to the stars. Uh, there was an error in the equation. We have that fix, and we've already taken ET home. That we're probably going to have to find these new realities and new physics out for ourselves. I, I, I just don't see the secret government releasing anything anytime soon. Uh, it's probably so surreal, so life changing, it would disrupt our society as we know it. And so they're probably doing it, you know, for our benefit. So uh, that's pretty much where I stand on that right now. Hmm, for our benefit, I, yeah, I don't know if I agree with that one. <laughs> or <laughs> well, think, if it is, they're going to botch it way, up. <laughs> religions, theology would have to change in a heartbeat. Right, right. And as soon as free energy is mentioned, our economy as we know it and the American dollar pretty much goes into chaos because mm -hmm. sure. our economy technically runs off of energy. And uh, if everything is now a free electricity and free energy, uh, and then you tack on to that, the, the overnight change in uh, religious beliefs, things could get pretty dicey real fast. Yeah, that's a good point. I guess they need to just put out more science fiction movies, that predictive <laughs> programming to get us uh, get us in the mood uh, or get us in the mode. But uh, in your book, you write, you feel that the moon is an artificial construct? I do. Um, you know, some of the Apollo missions, we, we, we dropped uh, a capsule onto the moon and it rang like a bell. And it wow. should not have done that. And we've done that twice. And some of the ancient cultures actually mentioned in their ancient writings, it's all been handed down verbally, that the moon was actually brought here somewhere between eleven and 12,000 years ago. And that's what caused the flood. Yeah, I've heard that too. Some other, some other writings I've seen say that uh, the reason it doesn't rotate is... Uh, there's secret bases on the back side, of course, which is another topic in itself. But the moon was really put here so we could be watched. Yeah, and this was in that it was done by the uh, by the visitors, the extraterrestrials, right? Exactly, exactly. There's too many coincidences with the moon. It's it's uh, it's an atypical moon to begin with, and uh, the chances of it being the exact distance to where it, it exactly surrounds, if you have the eclipse, it exactly fits right over the sun. The chances of that happening is, is astronomical. Uh, it, 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 it's pretty much just unbelievable. Let me put it that way. Uh, uh, it, it just plays into the hand that I believe it's an artificial construct. Yeah, and there are ancient stories of a second moon. There's a whole bunch. There's. I always love this uh, episode of Doctor Who that the moon is actually uh, an egg of a monster that got put up there. So it uh, certainly fascinated in that. I don't think science has ever had a good explanation of how the moon, our moon, came about. Uh, oh, they and, know. Oh, they yeah, know. Vince, what is your stance? I think you're more on the other side, right? Or what's your stance or what theories do have you read? No, I think it's artificial. Oh, yeah? Um, yeah, not only the um, things that Wallace has mentioned, but one time I was playing with a calculator, and I think I've told this story before on the, on, on the air here. Um, if you take the speed of light and divide it by the gravitational constant, you know, acceleration for the Earth, you get a time. And that time happens to be the number of seconds in a lunar year, uh, a lunar sidereal year. Uh, which, what's the chances of that? You know, wow, it's almost yeah. like a signature. So, you know, <laughs> and, you know, it's it's just, the, you know, all, all the things Wallace said, it's too big, It's now it's hollow, covers the sun, so. Yeah, I guess, uh, well, Stanley Kubrick must be proud. Well, <laughs> <laughs> if he made a fake movie about a fake moon landing, about a fake moon, so. Yeah, curious. I, I love Doctor Who, by the way. 
Oh, yeah, yeah. You're also into Star Trek. So before you're a Star Trek. Before your event, you were basically a conservative Christian who enjoyed science fiction. Exactly, exactly. I I remember I was in the fourth grade when the very first Star Trek came on TV in 1966, and I was so anxious to see it. And I've been a fan ever since of Star Trek. And, you know, growing up, when I would see a lot of the Flying Saucer movies, it was kind of scary, but we've been indoctrinated now, you know, with uh, so much science fiction that, that it's no longer scary. Um, I think a lot of that was done on purpose since the 50s. Yeah, I mean, the Cold War certainly changed things, or maybe it was either the Cold War, or I guess you would say the 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 atomic explosions. Do you think the nuclear age really advanced things or caught the attention of the extraterrestrials? Or what What do you see? How did things change before the Cold War and during uh, the, our discovery of nuclear power? Well, some of my readings and studies have uh, kind of taught me the aliens did not like us setting off nuclear uh, uh, bombs. They were concerned for our own security and safety and uh then we started having a lot of these crafts show up some crashing and whatnot such as roswell and uh you know you've you've i'm sure have seen videos and heard about you know what happened at some of our missile bases like at maelstrom uh they literally took control and i think they're just letting us know that we are being watched and monitored. And I think we've been watched and monitored since day one. I uh, can't ascertain when day one was, but I'm pretty sure that uh, we're not alone and we're still being monitored this very second. What are your views on an- Antarctica? What do you think the secrets are there? Place that the Nazis and so many other oh, empires and groups have, were very interested in. Well, I... I I'm pretty much adept on what happened with Operation High Jump with Admiral Byrd. And, you know, that occurred in, uh, what, a year after or so, a year and a half after World War II ended. And I believe that there's some stuff hidden down there. Uh, I've seen some videos from Melinda Malton Howe. I've seen uh, some other videos. Uh I've read what happened, what happened with Bird's diary. And uh, I'm pretty much convinced that there's some hidden secrets down there. Now, what those hidden secrets are, I'm not sure. But I do believe we have an alien presence on this planet uh, today. We've always had that. And perhaps where they're working in conjunction with us at an underground base down there. I'm a firm believer of underground bases, by the way. And uh, maybe in Dulce, we're working with uh, aliens there. And uh, I'm pretty sure that we're uh, working with aliens and some other underground bases, one of which most likely is in Antarctica. And if somebody asks you what's a good resource or book or documentary, to dig deeper in the idea of underground bases and connected tunnels and all that, what would you suggest to them, Wallace? I would follow Linda Moulton Howe. Uh, she's, she's up on this stuff, um, and she's got a lot of videos on, on her uh, Earth Files website. That would be the place I would start. Great, great. That's definitely good to know. And, yeah, but at the same time, if we're working – with or there are uh, forces in the government or in other governments working with these uh, extraterrestrial beings, you also write that NASA is largely a farce, in part because of the JPL labs. Maybe could you uh, share more with the audience about this? I always like the uh, the term, uh, what does NASA stand for? Never a straight answer. They kind (laughs) of did it to themselves because they can Uh, never answer (laughs) Well, you just can't believe everything you see. No. <laughs> the, the pictures we get have gone through multiple processes, and they are experts at airbrushing. 
uh, uh, you know, I've read articles where a fellow's been in the elevator and uh, overheard comments, uh, something to the effect, well, we just airbrush those out. Oh, wow. Well, they airbrush a lot of things out. And here we are, 2022. Show me a valid picture of the back side of the moon that has not been altered. You can't. You can't. Um, there are things on the back side of the moon they don't want us to see. And there are some things on Mars they do not want us to see. And I'm fully, fully convinced of that. So NASA is, is basically what we get, the standard people in society, where the secret space race and secret government are so far advanced, they're already out there and, and uh, operating on another plane of physics. Let's put it that way. They have their own physics and we're all, we still struggle with you know what we're what we've been taught here so that's pretty much my belief on that yeah i mean i think nasa has really just become instead of a, a scientific body it's more of the like the ministry of truth or a marketing agency or something like that well that that's what it is it, it's it's we we will struggle along and and we will you know, eventually perhaps get someone to Mars, but uh, it, it, it's, we're going to have to do all this ourselves, I believe. I don't see any any big informational drop uh, coming from the secret government. I, I just don't see that anytime soon. I, I think they think that we're not ready for it, and they could very well be right. Yeah, my attitude is if it can be destroyed by the truth, it deserves to be destroyed by the truth. I mean, living a lie is, uh, I think we need just need to end that. Uh, but yeah, but some of the stuff that NASA does, like uh, the there were some pictures from the Apollo 12 or the moon landing, and they said that they lost them. And the most ridiculous things, the excuses they come up with and the contradictions, I mean... Uh, at the same time, don't you feel, Wallace, that researchers like you, like others, Cardin, so many great researchers that are out there, it's catching up with them. They can't keep the secret for too oh, long. Sure, sure. I mean, in, in my first book, uh, in the back, I have some selected uh, comments and, and quotes, and I have some in there from Neil Armstrong. And, you know, when... It, let, let's get one thing clear. When the astronauts were up there, they have two channels, the one for everybody and then the secret channel. And, uh, you know, the ham operators picked up uh, things that perhaps we shouldn't know. But Neil Armstrong said, well, they were huge and menacing. Mm -hmm. I mean, they were right there lined up along the edge of the crater looking at us. Now, what is he talking about? Whoa. We were not alone when we were up there. And then, uh, uh, you know, then the logical mind has to, has to ask if, well, if we were up there in the early 70s, why haven't we been back? That's a big question. Yeah, or any other This country. is 2022. <laughs> what happened? What happened? Well, you know, I'm pretty much convinced that they did not want us to come back. And... The, the money, the trillions of dollars that, uh, that, that's been forwarded to the secret government, uh, we've already been on Mars. We've already been on moons within our solar system, and we've already been beyond our solar system. So that's pretty much what we've done uh, since yeah. the 70s. What do you think, Vance? What, what do you think? Why do you think we haven't been back to the moon? Yeah, pretty much the same reason. I mean, Ben Rich from Lockheed Skunk Works years, years ago said that we had the technology to send ET home, basically, I think that's what he said. <laughs> so, you know, I have to believe him, and nobody's debunked him or anything or said he was crazy, and he would know because that's, you know, one of the places you develop, uh, you know, I have no personal knowledge, but um, that's one of the places you develop vehicles like that. And... Um, there are, you know, Gordon Cooper um, uh, had a landing at L.A. Air Force Base, I think it was. Maybe I've got the base wrong. But uh, he didn't see the crafts himself, but he saw some frames of the film before 
the uh, men in black or whatever you want to call it came and snatched the film reels away. <laughs> so there's a, there's enough, you know, stuff that leaks out. I, I think, and, and the other problem is that the government, um, if, if, if the government has developed um, craft that have the characteristics that we see in UFOs, it would be a national security secret. You wouldn't want other countries to have that technology because it's also, you can weaponize that type of technology. So uh, think about it, you know, flying saucers that can just hover in the air and then choo, uh, move out. Well, if you had a radio control, you can make it into a missile or a bomb. That, so, you know. You know, on King Jong-un from North Korea flying around. <laughs> <laughs> Well, so, here's, so, here's a thought that I've had, uh, uh, Vance. I'll, I'll just throw it out. What if all, what if we're not the only one out there? What, if, what if actually China, Russia, Lithuania, France, England, and a bunch of other countries are all in this together with us and the little skirmishes and stuff that we have have going on down here uh, are really just second nature. Technically, we know we could just come in in um, in uh, cloaked crafts and hit a button and destroy whatever we need to destroy, and that's the end of that war. So this can just play out over here. Humanity, or at least organized humanity, is already out there. Uh, I, there's a part of me that says that there's, you know, the dichotomy of, of two different realities. And you have all, all the scientists and the MIT grads and whatnot and the uh, 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 laboratory people from the government out there already that, that, that have their own set of physics and reality and everything else happens here is just for the common common people like us uh, that that's that's been going through my mind a lot um could be and you know it could be a global supranational organization that's not answerable to any of the exactly, nation states exactly exactly and they could they could even have the you know an off world office uh it's just it's just so secret and would disrupt society so bad that it just has to be that separate. Yep. An old program that I love to this day called The Prisoner from the 60s actually touched on that, the global organization that wasn't specifically tied to any particular national government, had super technology. And at the end, the very last episode, you know, they had they had them all evacuating the village <laughs> in rockets. <laughs> <laughs> You guys remember that show called UFO? I think. 60s. Oh yeah, that I was that. fun yeah. as a kid yeah. because it was always the same. These little flying saucers would come. We'd send our little spaceships and we'd blow them up, and that was it. Pretty much the whole plot, wasn't it? Yeah, I mean, that's all I remember. Yeah, Benedict Cumberbatch's uh, mother, uh, Virginia Haskell, was in oh, that. Yeah, really? yeah, she was a nice looking lady, um, definitely. Oh, and then another one, the prisoner. Too. Yeah, and there was a, was the name of the show also too that I loved, which. I wish they'd do again where the moon broke off and it was just floating. Space 1999. Yeah, it was a Canadian and it had uh, Maya. Yeah. That yeah. was another great one. And Barbara Bain, yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, yeah, more good science fiction. And, uh, Wallace, what do you think happened at Roswell? Again, we've had many guests with different points of view. What do you think happened or what do you think is the best argument right now? Well, there was definitely crashes, and I say plural crashes. Um, definitely small bodies. Um, definitely a cover up and multiple cover ups. And we've had that technology now for what, 70 years? And I'm wondering what we've done with it. <laughs> um, and hit I'm, also, I'm also a believer in Otis Carr before he went kind of crazy. Otis Carr was, you may know, the protege of Nikola's uh, Tesla, mm -hmm. Nikolai Tesla. And I honestly believe he did make a craft and it, it did fly and it, it did it did elapse space time. 
And this was back in the 50s. And then the feds came in and took everything. And then, of course, he ended up basically falling off the deep end, going crazy, and ended up getting arrested and all this and that. But uh, thanks to Richard Ring, uh, Roger Ring, uh, I think I'm, that's his last name, Ring for sure. He's got a website. Uh, he's a 20-year Army vet. Uh, he actually flew in that craft. And, uh, you know, his information is pretty much uh, dead on. But we've we've had this technology uh, since the 50s for sure. And here it is 2022. So, you know, we've definitely got the underground bases. We've definitely got people working on all this technology. And we've definitely been out there already. I mean, I don't know what more I can say to that. I, uh, I'm not a member of the Secret Space Society, but uh, I know if you believe Corey Good and some of these people, uh, uh, we 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 solicit some people for uh, for like a 20 year term and uh, then put them back in society. And we're actually at war out there now. We have some enemies, but we've also got some people on our side. By enemies, what do you mean? Well, there's some races that may not. Uh, want us to be around let's put it that way uh like the italians yeah. <laughs> oh, <laughs> sorry no. <laughs> no alien races the oh, lizards okay. the reptilians the lizard, yes yes i was just joking <laughs> well the rip reptilians may actually be on our side I, I i'm not so sure but uh you know depending on who you believe and there's so many sources of information out there that uh uh, there's there's as many as 80 different species, and that's probably right. not the right word to say, and maybe, you know, 10 to 14 of them's here now uh, uh, among us, and not all of them are beloved. So, so. Yeah, and some things. have a different morality than human morality. Exactly. And uh, you wonder why there's wars in heaven. Uh, <laughs> Yeah, exactly. And uh, I remember when just out of the, it seemed like out of the blue, Trump just came out with this idea of the Space Force. And I was thinking, well, it seems who need, nobody way. asked for this. Yeah, it just, seems that way. But yeah, let me right. Tell you, that's been that's been working for a long time. All, all that allowed is, is uh, money to be funneled to them legally. <laughs> of course, instead of laundering it or as uh oh, or missing 30 trillion out. dollars how many trillions of dollars there's just unaccounted for and right, it's all in the pentagon pretty much to the pentagon yeah and if anybody gets suspicious we just run a plane into it right <laughs> like we did in <laughs> 2001 so uh so oh. basically so yeah so and this space force when it becomes public I mean, are they going to just say, well, we're looking for aliens. We're keeping the skies, the Elon Musk satellites protected. I mean, I'm trying to figure out what their narrative is. Well, they would probably say they're trying to keep us safe mm -hmm. here on Earth. That, that plays out better than anything. But I'm sure they have some ulterior motives, such as tweaking DNA or blending oh, DNA or... Uh, things of that nature. Um, who knows? It could be, you know, anything. Yeah, and the problem is it's always going to be manipulation or it's going to be the, the term the CIA uses, limited hangout, where they just give out enough of the truth, but it actually obfuscates you from the bigger picture and so on and so on. That's why I'm so against this sort of trying to protect us and I'll just yeah, I'm, I'm, break I'm it all I'm not sure over. we're ever going to see the big picture because there, there's this two-tier mm -hmm. uh, reality. They have their own reality and their own set of rules. And all of us commoners, we <laughs> pretty much have to find out reality and, and increase our evolutionary knowledge by trial and error ourselves. Uh, I just don't see them doing a big dump of, you know, physics and uh, information that they gleaned on us. Uh, um, and they're going to say it's for our own security and for our own well-being. I, I, that's pretty much my my take on that. 
Yeah, well, thank God for all those researchers, because else in your book, Wallace, you say one thing I've realized in the last six years since you had your alien encounter is that a lot of what we have in the Bible has been manipulated to serve the powerful church of the Middle Age. In other words, you realize, too, that uh, you just don't have the government hiding things. But for many centuries, our religious leaders have been hiding things. Who knows what the Vatican has? Yeah, we all wonder, yes. But, um, you know, seeing the craft, I had to know, you know, what I've been taught. Was it right or was it wrong? So <clears throat> one of the things I did was back up and, and studied early church history. And in doing so, lo and behold, all this information that you never hear in church or Sunday school or Bible studies. I mean. The Bible has been changed so many times and is is full of, uh, well, let's just say conundrums that uh, that's glossed over by so many people. Uh, and that, that you know, it's just another book for me now. <laughs> I, I, I'm still, you know, a disciple of Christ, but the Bible as it's written doesn't do a whole lot uh, uh, for me. It's been really put together. Uh, to serve the the purposes of the church. And don't get me wrong, I guess the church did act, you know, as as a a cohesive force for society going through, you know, the Middle Ages. Right. You know, uh, know, when John Calvin and Tyndale and Wesley came about and and whatnot, things changed. And and, uh, here we are in 2022, and uh, I realize that it... it, uh, has been manipulated so many times that uh, you really, really got to watch, you know, what's in there. So, yeah, you got to ask a lot of questions. And and you also accept for inspiration or even for research on uh, alien encounters, other books from other religions? Well, uh, I've, let me back up. Often we want to know that we're right. And, uh, if if you're the uh, you know a good a good stout Christian, you go to a bookstore, you're not going to find a book on Buddhism or Hinduism in a Christian bookstore, and you're going to go to the Christian bookstore to buy books to supplement what you already know and already believe. All you're right. afraid to jump from one lily pad to the other, although it's all in the same pond and it's okay to swim. Um, I have found many truths in all the religions. Uh, I look at all their teachers as masters or their masters as teachers. And I look at Jesus now primarily as a teacher. I don't look at him as a savior anymore. I look at him as a teacher. I feel that he came here to teach. And one of the attributes of him being a master was that he could also heal, of course. But um, if, if you look at what happened with him in the transfiguration. And uh, Jesus himself is a creature of the light. And Jesus's half brother, James, Apostle James, you know, mentions the word father of lights. And if you take what happened in the transfiguration, as well as what's in some other, other stories, Jesus himself is a creature of light, and we're all creatures of light. So now I look, I look at Jesus as just being my brother. He's just more advanced than I am. And we're all creatures of the light. We're all light beings, spiritual light beings. And uh, that that's one of the realizations I've come to now, uh, along with reincarnation, which was okay in the early church, by the way. And it got removed. Yeah. Uh, Origen had his own. Uh, beliefs on reincarnation, and at one point he was called the brightest church, uh, brightest mind the church ever had. And for two hundred years, his beliefs were okay within the church, and he had his own form and beliefs of reincarnation. But uh, by the time it got down to Jerome, when the Bible got put together, and later by Theodora and, and Emperor Justine, and, and even later on. Everything about reincarnation, aside from John the Baptist, was pretty much taken out. And here we are 
we're taught that we have this one life and you better get it right. <laughs> yeah. You better come to Jesus and be saved now and be born again and confess your sins. Otherwise you're going to hell. And that's, you know, that, that's, <laughs> that's all in my background now. That's, that's in the rear view mirror. <laughs> when did you uh, realize or accept that uh, reincarnation was, uh, was a good option or a good doctrine? Well, it's been within the last six years, um, you know, backing, backing up and, and reading the, the history of the church and reading the other, uh, uh, what we call religions that are out there, uh, you realize that, you know, it's been in existence. And then you tack on to that all the near-death experiences that people have had and then the people that says they've died and gone to heaven and come back. And, and uh, there's a really good book out there uh, by Dr. Michael Newton, PhD, who has 29 case studies of people who have, you know, been into um, hypnosis, what they call retro hip hypnosis. You go back and they all talk about previous lives and coming back and uh, you factor in Edgar Casey who I'm a fan of you know yeah, great people great have idea. previous lives some go back to Atlanta soon some go back even more than that and and it has to be that there's there's more to life than just us being in this body <laughs> for 70 or 80 years and then <laughs> it's gone and then we're walking on streets of gold the rest of eternity <laughs> Uh, I don't think you go from pre-K to grad school uh, with, you know, one death. There's too many cases out there that, that uh, your spirit leaves your body and goes back home uh, in the spiritual realm uh, where time doesn't exist and where love permeates everything. And, you know, you're, what you've done in this lifetime is presented to you. And you learn from your mistakes and uh, you'll have a guide. Everybody has a guide, a spiritual guide. And uh, I have a good case of an NDE in Within Grasp. When you, uh, I interviewed uh, a spiritual empath, uh, Reverend Barbara DeLong. She's, she's uh, one of the interviews in that book. And she tells of a, a really neat uh, experience in, in I'll just share that with our listeners now. Yeah, please do. Um, she was friends with a, a lady who had cancer. They were they were close, and uh, she knew she was going to die. And uh, one night, about three o'clock in the morning, Robert Barbara was a sound asleep, and she realized she was in this tunnel, and there was her friend with her, and they were both in this dark tunnel. And the friend says, well, I guess I croaked. <laughs> and Barbara says, <laughs> I guess you did. We're here. And uh, uh, eventually they see this little dog coming. And at first, Barbara thought it was her guide. But uh, the friend says, no, that, that's my, my best friend. And a little bit later, they see this little light way down the hallway. and. Uh, or what we call the tunnel. There's so many tunnels. Um, and, it, you know, to make a long story short, the, the friend wanted Barbara to stay, but Barbara said she had other things to do in this life, that your spirit guide is here now. So the friend took off and, and met up with the spirit guide and went on. And Barbara woke up, you know, minutes after that. And lo and behold, she was covered in dog slobber from where that uh, dog had hopped on to her, both her and her friend, and licked them in the tunnel. And she woke up in her bed covered in dog slobber. Now, that, that's something to think about. And then later that morning, uh, uh, a friend called and said, I guess you know that uh, her friend passed away, and she said, "Yeah, it was three o'clock, wasn't it?" They wow, said, it was. amazing! So that's that's just some of the things that that happened. There's some, there's too many cases of people, you know, leaving their bodies, and one of the reasons I interviewed uh, uh, 
retired major, Dr. Paul Smith. He was Project Stargate. He's in my book also. So I wanted to show what we have within us powers that we can do with our brain. Uh, you know, the, this Project Stargate was basically run by the CIA, but it was remote viewing where people can actually take their senses. They remain physically in a chair, but they can take their spiritual senses, leave their body and go out and see things. And I ask questions, you know, did doors or masks present a problem? The answer is no. Did did uh, distance present a problem? The answer was no. You don't pay any attention to distance. I ask, was there intelligent life on the back of the moon? <laughs> and he said, that's funny, that came up. We were just discussing that. <laughs> I'm not going to say that there were bases back there, but I'm not going to discount that either. So. <laughs> He Ingo was, Swan. Ingo Swan um, had a whole book about that. About Ingo the, uh, Swan was was the founder of that, and uh, yep. Paul Smith knows him very well. knew him knew of him and knew him. Paul Smith now teaches remote viewing uh, in Utah, but he had he had a claim to fame that uh, he saw the USS Stark incident days in advance, literally verbatim, exactly the way it happened. And that, that's just one example of what remote viewing could do. Uh, we use it extensively in the secret government. We could go under, under the ocean and see Russian submarines. We could go out into space. We could do all kinds of things. And now all of a sudden, supposedly, you know, it's been terminated. Right. I find a little bit surprised. <laughs> Yeah, if it works, they're not going to stop it. And you know exactly. the Russians haven't stopped. They're not going to stop it. <laughs> exactly, exactly. But it's something that we have the – actually, we have the ability to do. Right, all of us. Just not trained. Mm -hmm. And I, I, mentioned, I mentioned the Apostle Paul uh, in the same regard. You know, we had the Damascus Road experience, and uh, we immediately think that he became an apostle right after that but that was not what happened no he went to saudi arabia for three years for training mm -hmm. and we don't know who trained him i mean there's all kinds of thoughts out there maybe it was jesus himself maybe he went to a mystery school or, or something but uh, after that three years he came back and then was an apostle then he had powers he did not have before he looked at Elimus and was able to blind him with his brain. And here he was, a tent maker, just a few years before. And then he was able to bring a uh, fellow back from life. And, you, know, he could, you know, only Peter did that, aside from Jesus. Paul didn't have those powers before. So, so we have potential in our brain uh, that is not being used. And we don't have any teachers. And it's unfortunate that most of the Gnostic literature was removed, uh, all of it basically removed uh, uh, from the canon, what made it into the Bible. A lot of the Gnostic literature mm -hmm. really plays into using your brain in a lot of ways like that. And, and uh, we just removed it. That is true. That is very true. Well, uh, Vince, do you have a question for Wallace? Yeah. Um, do you think Jesus had past lives? Um, and if so, um, do you have any guesses as to who he was? Like some people say Melchizedek, the priest that was mentioned in the Old Testament, what might have been, uh, you know, the spirit of Jesus. What, what, what do you think? Well, I don't, I, I call him Melchizedek. Yeah, it's probably better. Um, Melchizedek had no father and no mother. But Jesus had a earthly mother and a spiritual father. So from that standpoint, I, I don't think they were one and the same. I actually think that Melchizedek was probably an advanced being even more so than Jesus. Uh, uh, do I think that he, he had had previous lives? Yes, I do, because we're all sons of God. And I look at Jesus as a brother. He's just much more advanced uh, uh, than perhaps you and I are. 
we're all on our own paths. We're all heading towards the light, but he has been around a lot longer and has advanced a lot more. And uh, he came back to teach us. And uh, that that's, that's my take on that right now. How many times he's incarnated before and how long that happened, I do not know. And I've been asked, how many times do you reincarnate and how long does it take? And, and the answer really is as long as it takes, because there is no time as we understand it when you're in the spiritual world. Time only exists for us here and now. So, you know, there, there's good things for all of us in our future. We will learn from our mistakes. We'll have a say-so in uh, where and which family we incarnate into again. Uh, so stay tuned. <laughs> <laughs> How about um, Jesus and the aliens? Do you think Jesus actually had communion with uh, extraterrestrials? Or, I believe uh, Jesus was a hybrid, uh, a true hybrid. Did ah. what, what we call extraterrestrials, do I believe that? The answer would, would I would have to say yes. Uh, anything concerning a craft back then would be considered an extraterrestrial. Uh, even we are extraterrestrial. Uh, I think that we were actually, you know, put here. I don't think we started with the planet and evolved over 4.5 billion years. I think that uh, somebody somewhere, and you can think Anunnaki if you want, but somebody somewhere has tweaked us and uh, we've come a long way real fast, maybe faster than you know, we would have originally uh, uh, have done. Makes sense. And yeah, and, uh, we'll have this on the show notes, but for the audience listening in and audio, where can they find out more about you? Thank you. I have a website. It's uh, withingrasp.net. There you can find out all about my latest book. Um, you can also go to Amazon. Uh, you can uh, purchase both books there. They're also available in Kindle. My first book is available in grayscale or the full color edition. It was really written uh, in color. I have a lot of color pictures. And being that I was a novice, I learned that if you put one color picture in the book, it makes the whole book color and <laughs> it's exponentially more expensive. So that, that's yeah, why yeah. eight and a half by 11 full color book is so much more expensive than the eight by 10 grayscale. So I wanted to clarify that. But you can find out about me and um, within grasp uh, on that website. You can also contact me from there. Wonderful. Well, you heard it here, audience, you heretics. Uh, check out Wallace's book. Very, very good. And uh, yeah, there's a section full of uh, great interviews. He mentioned a couple in this interview, but detailed long interviews with some of the best and brightest today on ufology, extraterrestrials and all that. So yeah, check it out. But we, again, we are at the end of our journey across the stars. Vance, thank you very much for keeping us company. Okay. As always, my pleasure. And it's great uh, being with you, Wallace, and hearing what you had to say and uh, and love the conversation. Likewise, you, Wallace. Vance. Yes, Wallace, we really enjoyed. And uh, good luck with your uh, the rest of your books, your work, and uh, we look forward to having you on in the future. Thank you, Michael. I certainly appreciate it. The pleasure has been mine. I wish you both the best. Thank you. Thanks. And there you have it, you shining crazy diamonds. Wallace takes us on a journey across so many stars. In our second part, Wallace will discuss if aliens have past lives and reincarnation in general. He'll grant us his take on ghosts and the interaction of the spirit and the alien world in other planets. Then Wallace will pivot to the God of the Old Testament aliens in the Bible, and the forgotten goddess Asherah. And you know he shared about the Gnostic Gospels and the Book of Enoch, and much more. So please become a member for the full alien invasion, 
it's only $6.99 for AB Prime or $4.99 at Red Circle or whatever you want to pledge on Patreon. All of this a month. The Virtual Alexandria Academy is now open. Link on the show notes and on my homepage. But here is a brief summary of online education you won't find anywhere else on the internet. You get four modules, more than 25 hours, and 15-plus classes of visually stunning video slides and commentaries from me and even some experts, academics, theologians in the Gnostic fields. There are detailed instructions, audio-video recreations, and materials you can use for research or incorporation into your spiritual praxis. There are downloadable assets like prayers to the Gnostic goddess, vowel magic and chanting science, astral flight rituals, and more. The Virtual Alexandria Academy also includes Gnostic astral journey diagrams, magical seal graphics, and detailed reconstructions of Gnostic rituals, and bonus videos to better understand the module themes, and so much more. As a holiday slash rollout promo, get 20% off with the code AOMBYTE. And that's it. Thanks for being here. Thanks for being yourself, your true alien self, here in the desert of the real. Hello and goodbye, as always.